We live in a fantasy world now. Reality has been destroyed. This is the time that you really need to pay attention. The probabilities are overwhelmingly on gold's side. That is the best environment to see gold increase its value. Welcome to Palisades Gold Radio. I'm your host, Tom Bodrovix. Joining me today is Ted Butler from butlerresearch.com. Thanks for joining me today, Ted. Thanks for having me, Tom. So recently you wrote an article simply entitled Cheating. Why don't we start by getting your definition of cheating and who is doing this cheating? Well, obviously it's in connection particularly with the silver market, the COMEX futures market to be specific. And the uh, cheaters or those that are doing the nasty are what we call the commercial traders, the commercial side of the market. That word commercial, you know, throws uh, people into a thought process that I don't think is correct. It, it, it implies that the commercials on the COMEX are mining companies and legitimate hedgers of commodities, silver and gold and, and other commodities. And that's not the case. The, the commercials is just a term that the CFTC, the Commodity Commission, lumps and categorizes different traders by. And the commercials are every much speculators, as are the non-commercials, who are generally considered to be pure speculators. Everybody's speculating. That's one of the key features I would mention. There's no real, true, legitimate hedging the transfer of risk from producers to speculators taking place on the COMEX. So virtually none. So basically what's happened is hiding under the guise of being legitimate hedgers, these commercials, which are you know basically banks and financial institutions operating as if they were hedging and legitimate traders, they're basically cheating the other traders and how they cheat is that they send out false price signals via high frequency algorithmic computer based trading that can set the price and they do that these commercial cheaters because they know that the speculators on the other side particularly managed money traders we call the category but others as well operate under a technical basis technical format they generally buy when prices go up they sell when prices go down. So what the commercials can do is basically send out false price signals, today being a perfect example. Uh, we're down, you know, new lows in, in silver. And the only reason we're down, we're not down because there's too much silver in the world or not enough demand or anything like that. That's nonsense. We're down because the commercials on the COMEX are you know, all out cheating today, setting the price as low as they can through artificial means and getting the other side, the managed money traders, the other non-commercial speculators to react to those sell signals and sell. When they see lower prices, they sell these guys and the commercials buy. On, on every price decline, okay, over the last 40 years, four zero, four decades, on every big price decline, the commercials always end up net buyers as prices go down and the non-commercials, managed money traders and others, end up as net sellers. There's, there's never been an exception to that in 40 years and it's documented in the weekly commitment of traders report. So the cheating is basically, you know, it's like a three card money game only for many millions and billions of dollars where the commercials are flipping three cards or walnut shells on a counter and asking the the other side to guess. But the difference being is that when they send out these false price signals, the other side reacts because everybody's a technician nowadays and they want to follow, they want to be momentum traders, et cetera. So that's basically how the game is work. It's cheating because the markets are not designed, weren't approved by the U.S. Congress to, for this purpose. The markets were approved and we were allowed to have futures, regulated futures trading, so that the real legitimate producers could hedge their risks and speculators would take it. But the real producers are not part of this, okay? They're someplace else, not on the Commodity Exchange, Inc., not on the COMEX. And the 
commercials have run with that, and it's pure cheating. There's nothing but cheating going on. So, Ted, when we think about these short positions, and like you say, the concentrated short positions that exist on the COMEX, is it possible that they're hedging their exposure in other markets, like let's say the OTC market or something like that? Well, that sounds good. That's always a go-to kind of thing because no one can prove it. It's like there's no any kind of transparency in the OTC markets. We get a quarterly OCC report, Office of the Control of the Currency, that measures these things, but it's as clear as mud. They don't disclose any kind of detail whatsoever. So it's a convenient excuse to say that all the commercials basically have such a big short position on the COMEX because they're hedging, you know, what what is, I guess, a long position on the on the over-the-counter market. But when you stop and think about it, who the heck is going short on the over-the-counter market if it's not the same COMEX crooks, okay, that are short in the future? Is it, it doesn't make any sense whatsoever. It's one of those things that sounds good until you think about it a bit. And then you see it's pure nonsense. So I would put that in the pure nonsense category. Mm -hmm. So how is this cheating different than the spoofing that, for example, JP Morgan was convicted of and was fined something like $960 million for? Oh, along with a, no a good number of other banks as well. Okay. So it's not, it wasn't just uh, mm -hmm. JP Morgan. Yeah, no, it, it, spoofing, as I've alleged from the moment the JP Morgan case came visible a couple of years back, two or three years back. Spoofing is a short-term tool, okay? One of the, the many tools in the uh, COMEX commercial crooks, cheaters, dirty toolbox, okay? It's a short-term tool that can influence the price on a very short-term basis, a few seconds, a minute, something like that. But what I maintained from the beginning was that if the Justice Department and the CFTC were going to focus solely and specifically on spoofing the short-term dirty trick, okay, and not focus on the bigger picture, the concentrated short position and the way that the commercials on the COMEX never sell when prices are going down on, on a net basis, they only buy on, on a net basis. If the regulators in the DOJ were going to stick right to spoofing, okay, that would let the real crime, the manipulation, the price suppression, okay, of silver slide. And that's exactly what happened. So, yeah, J.P. Morgan got slapped on the wrist for a few hundred million dollars if they pay that, okay. It's, uh, there's always... You know, you, you have to wait a, a few years to see what they actually paid, and usually it's not that much. But they let J.P. Morgan and the others, big COMEX crooks, off the hook by sticking just to spoofing and ignoring the much bigger crime taking place, the actual manipulation, price suppression of silver, which is going on to this day as we speak. So spoofing is chicken feed. It's not the heart of the crime. The heart of the crime is the concentrated short position, even if that doesn't resonate with people, whatever, that's it. Mm -hmm. So you've brought this up to the CFTC through elected officials, Ted. And other than refuting your claims, have you ever gotten a response back from them? Oh, yeah. No, I thought I made that public. I've gotten many responses over the years. Going back like to 2004, in 2008, the CFTC made public responses to the same allegations I made then that I'm making now, that I've made now. And 15, 16 page public letters, they rejected and disputed every aspect of what I said. And plus, they, I had many private letters and correspondence with the CFTC, both through elected officials and directly to the commission, where they argued tooth and nail that what I was alleging about the concentrated short position was basically nonsense or it didn't matter. But this time, this time being in 2021, I wrote to them again because the evidence was so compelling what took place in the price spike 
into February 2nd, earlier this year, when the price shot up and it turned out that the four big shorts and on, on the comics did all the selling. I mean, they stopped it in its track and it's come down since then. So I wrote to them because it was revealed in the, the commission's data. OK, I didn't make the stuff up and wrote to them through a uh, elected officials, a congressman in particular, Congressman Mass from the district in Florida where where I'm registered. And his staff, particularly one of them, uh, did a marvelous job of following up with the CFTC. And they did respond uh, both to the congressman and to myself. And they basically said, this is kind of shocking, that they didn't argue with me. And it was in the past, it was 15, 16 page letters of, uh, you know, you're wrong and this is the reason and that's the reason and not, you know, on and on. This time they said, you know, we're basically taking what you're saying uh, into consideration and implied that they were turning it over into their two divisions, the division of market oversight and the enforcement division, the guys who have the, the hammer. And so it was like night and day. And I thought I made that. There's an article up on Silver Seek dated around May the 3rd or some May, May the 5th that I reproduce the CFTC's response. The important point is this. For the first time in so many years, 20 years, they no longer argue with me. They kind of said, you know, like, we're going to look into it. Or you can read the letter for yourself. It's up there on Silver Seek. But more important than that, since that date, okay, since early May, there's been somewhat of a remarkable transformance in the market in that the big shorts, okay, have steadily reduced their concentrated short position to basically the lowest levels in the case of the big four in about a year in the case of the big eight the eight big uh, shorts on the COMEX, as of last week's Commitment of Traders report, they held the lowest concentrated short position since 2015, six years ago. So there are signs, and my main contention is this. My main contention is that on the next rally in silver, significant rallies, you know, say over $30 or $28 or some number like that, if the big shorts, the big concentrated shorts, don't add to their short positions, then silver prices will fly, okay? There's nothing that's going to stop silver prices from exploding. The only thing that could possibly stop the price explosion that's to come in silver is if temporarily these big shorts come back in and add aggressively to their existing short positions. I don't think they will. I don't know for sure. They don't confide in me, but I don't think they will because they've gone to a lot of pain and measured action of reducing their short position now more than it's been in quite some time. And I do think that the CFTC in responding to me saying they're taking it under consideration, my allegations, they had to communicate this to these big short crooks. And it's evolving. Uh, we'll find out on the next rally. On the next rally, if these guys add short positions, and you can disregard what I'm saying now, if they don't add short positions, it's the conditions are just completely different and silver prices will explode. So we'll get to see that probably in the very near future. So is this part of the reason why you said in the article, Ted, that the era of cheating trading tricks is rapidly coming to an end and an era of not dominated by cheating trading tricks on the COMEX is about to begin? Absolutely. Okay. In fact, I mean, this big new decline that we've had today, it's been you know going on for a while, is that this is how the big shorts can buy back their short positions without people realizing it, whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, but okay, when the turn comes and when the rally begins in silver, because the only reason we're down in price is because these big commercial cheaters are rigging the price lower to do exactly this, buy back this short position. Once they stop shorting on the next rally, which I believe is going to be the case, I don't know that, but I believe it, it's a different world. 
Mm-hmm. It's, it's going to be a world in which I can give you an example. There was a time in, in the last 10 years or so where silver didn't have had a very large concentrated short position, but it didn't have the largest concentrated short position. Palladium, for a very short period of time, had the largest concentrated short position. Silver was number two, not far below it. It was palladium and silver neck and neck for a while, where it's been always silver being the largest short position, concentrated short position for like 35 years. Well, in any event, what's transformed is that palladium no longer has anywhere near close to the uh, large concentrated short position it had in the past. In fact, it's very average now. It's like not a, not a big deal anymore in palladium. Well, the difference being is that palladium was six hundred, eight hundred dollars at the time it had this very large concentrated short position, say 10 years ago or so. And today it doesn't have a big concentrated short position and the price is three, four, five times higher. That's exactly what's going to happen in silver. It's It's a template for what's going to happen in silver is that when this concentrated short position in silver gets to be in line, okay, with the short positions and every other commodity that's traded, then the price is going to be free and we're going to see the equivalent move in silver or more, but the equivalent move in silver that we saw in palladium, a five or six times move from where we are right now. And generally speaking, because silver is a primary investment asset, it's probably going to blow off much more than that what held palladium down, if you want to call it that, but to $3,000 or so, was that it, it's not a big investment item. It's strictly a, it's a precious metal, but it's an industrial item more than anything else, whereas silver is both. It's got the industrial kicker and the uh, investment asset kicker, which is you know why we're talking about it today. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's actually something I wanted to ask you about, Ted, was the last time we spoke, you were talking about the illegitimate short position in silver. So what makes it illegitimate? And do we see a comparable position like this in gold, for example? Or as you mentioned, is it more of a parallel to take, let's say, an industrial metal like platinum or palladium as an example? Well, to answer your question, what makes it legitimate or illegitimate in this particular case is basically common sense. Okay, you interview, and I'm glad you do, a good number, a a tremendous number uh, of people on this topic, people that are knowledgeable to look into silver and gold and whatever. And I don't think, and correct me if I'm wrong, that you've ever interviewed anybody that's been super bearish on silver, that is expecting the price to go down and stay down as far as the eye can see. Please tell me, have you had anybody on who's like super bearish on silver? No, nope, that's correct. Maybe a little bit on gold, but that's you know more related to a deflationary crash where the price would go down in accordance with people just you know basically getting margin called, and then from there they still see the price you know skyrocketing after that. Okay, fair. I mean, that's my understanding. So what I, what I guess what I'm getting at is this. Okay, you could talk to you know, a thousand people, 10,000 people, okay, if they knew anything about silver, I mean, most people don't, don't pay attention to it. But of those that pay attention to it, you know, it's really hard to find a bear. It's really hard to find someone that says, this thing ain't going to go up, don't even waste your time thinking about it, etc. So to answer your question with this point, is that what makes the short position illegitimate, the concentrated short position, illegitimate or not, is what good reason would anyone have to be so heavily short on silver, okay, when the whole world can look at it and say, this is a, a cheap commodity. This is, well, this is probably the cheapest commodity in the world. I'm sure many people have said that. I've said it, certainly. Mm-hmm. But who in their right mind would go heavily short more short in silver than in any other commodity, okay, for an item that everyone considers to be dirt cheap. There is no, I guess the point I'm trying to make, 
there is no legitimate explanation for why someone would be so heavily short silver. Otherwise, we would have heard it. Yeah, that's a fair point. You wouldn't be asking. It's like, give me, give me a reason. Is it, is it a mining company that's so heavily short? Oh yeah, which which mining company? Certainly none in a, in America or Canada or anybody that's listed on the stock exchange because they got to disclose all this stuff under SEC reporting and F, and FASB reporting rules. So anybody who's short heavily silver at this point is short for one reason, one reason only, and that's to keep the price down. And in no way, shape, or form can that be considered a legitimate explanation. So, Ted, the natural question that comes to my mind as you're talking about this is, what has changed now? Why would these big shorts let the price run now? You know, what is going to be the mechanics or the motivation behind them finally stepping back and actually going long instead of net short? Well, I don't know if they're going to be going long because if for them to go long, they have to find someone on the sell side or to go mm-hmm. short to them. And I don't, I don't think that's likely uh, by any stretch of the imagination. As far as what is going to change the equation, because this has been going on for decades and, you know, I'm, I'm be the first one to admit it. And there's a natural expectation that something that is continued is going to continue forever. But now on the other hand, you know, things that can't can possibly continue forever will end. And we're at that point, I believe in this for a number of reasons. One, we're talking about it. You're raising the issue. People are listening. And more and more people who focus in on this issue and see the illegitimacy of a, of a concentrated short position and how stupid it is that silver and illegal, that silver would be priced so cheaply to so many other commodities, including its own cost of production. You know, is that curiosity? It's that uh, inquisition that like, why is, why is it this way? And, and why can't the COMEX or the CFTC or JP Morgan or any of these big banks who I've accused of doing this, why don't they speak up? Why don't they say what they're doing and why it's so legitimate? So the point being, it's an indefensible action that they're involved in, criminal, illegal, unethical, cheating, whatever the hell you want to call it, Mm -hmm. okay? And there's no defense coming back, no rebuttal coming back. It's the sound of crickets. All you get is the sound of silence. So something like that, just my common sense, again, tells me if you can't defend something, maybe it's because it's, it's not defendable. And in this case, I don't think this concentrated short position is defendable. And therefore, after they're done whittling it down, and they have been whittling it down, the big eight are now less short than they've been in six years. It's not exactly uh, chop liver. It's a harbinger, I believe, of this change that's coming. But when the real change comes, when we go up is when we're going to know whether they add or not. If they don't add, it's going to be so abrupt and so obvious to everybody that this thing wasn't priced right beforehand. And this is the reason it wasn't priced right. We had a a few, a handful. Okay, it's preposterous. We have a handful, no more than eight, really no more than four. Okay, big traders that are holding down the price of silver. How illegitimate can you get? It's like that's like the most crooked thing in the world. That's why market manipulation is the number one market crime. It's it's not kidnapping, it's not child molesting, it's not murder, okay? But in terms of the markets, you can't get worse than market manipulation, and that's what's occurring in in Comex Silver. Mhm. So another point that you bring up in the article, Ted, is that the Bank of America's OTC derivatives position from December 31st, 2020 to March 31st has grown dramatically. So are they almost the new JP Morgan of the market? Not quite. There's only one JP Morgan. So let's be realistic. There's no one is in JP Morgan's class 
and caliber when it comes to uh, gold or silver and, and other markets as well. I, I don't follow all the markets, but I can tell you JP Morgan's the kingpin when it comes to gold and silver. And I doubt anybody could fill their uh, their shoes. What the article about uh, Bank America early in the year was about and it was further confirmed with a subsequent release of the quarterly derivatives report by the Treasury Department's OCC, Office of the Control of the Currency. Basically, my interpretation that that give you the bottom line is that J.P. Morgan snookered Bank America by inducing them or allowing them or permitting them to borrow physical silver, 300 million ounces altogether, Uh, Another 100 million ounces, I think, by Citibank that was borrowed from J.P. Morgan. And basically, this is the silver that came into all the ETFs over the last 14, 15 months or so. And it's, 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 it's basically owned by other entities now that are affiliated with J.P. Morgan. But the bottom line is that Bank America, as far as I can see, and, and Citibank, are, are on the hook. They borrowed combined 400 million ounces of physical silver from J.P. Morgan and J.P. Morgan's affiliates. And uh, now they're on the hook to return this borrowed silver, this 400 million ounces, someday. And when they go to return it and it's not available, they're going to have to pay up Okay, to whatever price you can you can imagine in order to return the silver or make a financial settlement with J.P. Morgan. J.P. Morgan, you know, put these guys deeper into the short hole than could be imagined with this leasing transaction. And by the way, I should point out that J.P. Morgan, which was the biggest short in silver and gold year after year after year after taking over Bear Stearns in 2008, J.P. Morgan has skated out the back, slipped out the back jack when it comes to the short position in COMEX silver. They are no longer short. They haven't been short COMEX gold or silver in more than a year, and they're sitting on a massive amount, uh, I say 1.2 billion ounces of, of silver and 30 million ounces of gold. They are prepared to make in position, J.P. Morgan's in position to make a god-awful amount of money when this thing goes up. And they have no, you know, real short liability at all because they bought back all their shorts long ago and in the process, double-crossing the existing and remaining big shorts, uh, who are also trying their best to get out of their short position. So, J.P. Morgan is in a class by themselves. No one can be compared to them. Absolutely. So something that obviously you look at quite a bit is the commitment of traders report. And it's been brought up on the show by a couple guests that have said that this is possible that the data that comes out on the commitment of traders report is unreliable or manipulated. What do you think about those claims, Ted? Horse poop. It's like if if you understood the methodology, how the report itself, uh, the commitment of traders report is conducted, is constructed, is it's probably the most reliable report of all for this reason. Mm -hmm. There's only about 200 some odd, we'll say 200 traders that qualify as being large traders. A large trader in silver is anybody who holds more than 150 contracts. A large trader in gold is anybody who holds more than uh, 200 contracts. Okay. So there's only about, I'm using round numbers, 200 of these traders, say in silver or gold, keeping track of them. They're, they're required by law, the traders to report, okay, their positions on a daily basis to the exchange and ultimately to the CFTC who gets the information from the exchange. It's all electronic nowadays. It's like everything is digital and the the information is transmitted, if not daily, many times a day. But basically, it's you know a fail-safe system because, as you know, in commodities, there has to be a long for every short and vice versa. So between the reality of that, the long and short having to exist, and the, the small number, 200 is not a lot, 
to keep track of electronically. Constructing the CFTC report is like a piece of cake. It's not like, you know, constructing the monthly employment statistics or housing starts or, you know, any of the big economic data that we all look at. It's a, it's a very tiny sampling of participants. They are required by law to publish and communicate and and disseminate to the exchange every day what their positions are. And if they don't, they get in trouble. So it's a a report. And plus, it's like there's a safety feature here, because if if a long, for instance, or a short were to misrepresent themselves, it would be a a misbalance. It It would be looking automatically, why doesn't this mathematical equation balance? Somebody must be reporting wrong. So anyone who says that the uh, commitment of traders report is bogus or you can't believe it or it's manipulated. They are like the dumbest clucks in the, in the world. Uh, I have a different word in mind, but it's like, <laughs> it, there's no basis for it whatsoever. It's ridiculous. Mm-hmm. Of course, the last time you and I spoke was in February, and that was right around the time, let's say, the silver squeeze was just starting. So do you think that the silver squeeze itself has awakened part of the market to the monetary side of silver? Well, I don't know about monetary. I don't know what 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 you know what that entails. Look, I I think you know the Wall Street, the Reddit Wall Street silver movement. I mean, has has got to raise awareness as does you know all the the commentary, interviews on your shows and others. It's like there's no question that the awareness is growing. There's also no question that it represents an extremely tiny percentage of the investing public. And the reason I think that is uh, good or potentially uh, dramatic is because there's plenty of room, okay, for more people to come in and become aware of what's going on simply because there's so few of them right now. But the numbers are growing. The publicity, the amount of talk and commentary that I see points to you know, more and more people picking up the silver standard. And from what I can see, uh, particularly with the Wall Street silver crowd, uh, the Reddit crowd, they're not interested in selling. They're they're interested in buying because they think the price is cheap and they're correct. I don't know if they completely understand why it's so cheap, you know, the concentrated short position, et cetera. But you can be sure that they don't look like they're going away anytime soon. Certainly, lower prices doesn't seem to have much impact. They don't seem to be quaking in their boots. Not that it can, I don't think it can fall that much after what it's already fallen. So I think the sky's the limit. I think everything is aligned. And it goes back to your question of just a little a bit ago, to what's going to prompt this thing to change, this manipulation. It's all these things. There's like a thousand different things that are, you know, zeroing in on the four or eight big crooks on the COMEX, the big cheaters, and their days are numbered. I can't tell you the exact day that the jig is going to be up for them, but it, it it's coming pretty soon. It's uh, yeah, I don't I don't think with all these things going on, it's coming very soon. Mm-hmm. So Ted, let's say as a as a symptom of demand and shortness of supply, have you been paying attention to the premiums in the silver market? Let's say either in the thousand ounce bar market or in the retail side, the smaller denominations. What do those premiums look like in February and March versus right now? Well, I think that when you're talking about premiums, you're basically talking about retail forms of silver. That's where the the big premiums have been. I, I understand they may have, you know, cooled off a little bit recently, but that doesn't that that doesn't matter. Whether it's uh, you're paying, you know, you know, ten dollars over for a silver eagle or six or seven dollars over for a for a silver eagle, that that's not a you know that that that's not a material difference. It's an indication that retail demand is red hot. We're we're in the tightest, okay, strongest demand for retail forms of silver in history. I don't think there's ever been a time when, you know, we've been as consistently strong, 
okay as as we've been in the last six months or so in in physical silver premiums on on retail silver there, there really shouldn't be any premiums at all on thousand ounce bars because that's the stuff that's on the on the comax that's the stuff that's bought in the in the etfs and for my mind if if you're if you're buying you know taking delivery or something like that there there's very little premium going on the demand for that has been phenomenal for thousand ounce bars and that's the form of silver that needs to be focused in on because that's the form of silver once this paper cheating on the comex goes by the wayside which is it will happen okay what's going to determine the price of silver is going to be silver in 1,000 ounce bar form. And if you look at the statistics on silver in 1,000 ounce bar form, they are so tight as to defy description. Basically, I think there's something like, from everything I've looked at, there's something like 2 billion ounces of silver in the world in 1,000 ounce good delivery industry standard bars. 2 billion ounces with a B. On a 1,000 ounce bar contract, that means there's 2 million such bars, 2 million 1,000 ounce bars. I can see 1.6 billion ounces tied up already, publicly held in the world ETFs and on the COMEX. There's 1.6 billion ounces of the 2 billion ounces that exist in the world, okay, are already spoken for, tied up on the COMEX or in the world ETFs, SLV, PSLV, the Deutsche Bank, the ZKB, the SIVR. There's a whole bunch of of, of silver ETFs. And that means that 80%, 80, 80% of all the silver in 1,000 ounce bar form in the world, okay, of 2 billion ounces is already spoken for and held in basically publicly owned hands, ETFs being publicly traded investment vehicles. So when you think of how much silver is left for potential investment going forward, the number is negligible and it wouldn't take much, okay, to, to, to vault the price towards the heavens. The real question and miracle, if you want to say, is that these crooks on the COMEX, cheating as they do in the futures market, have managed to keep the price as low as it is, considering how tightly it is held, the the existing physical supply. And it's like they're holding it together with with this futures, this this manipulation in the futures market, this concentrated short selling. It's like they're holding the whole thing together with uh, chewing gum and chicken wire. (laughs) This thing is going to blow sky high the minute these big shorts take a step towards the door as prices are rising. They don't have a real compulsion to to rush until prices start to rise. And that's when we're going to see whether we have the biggest short squeeze in history or whether these guys are going to come in and add to short positions aggressively, in which case, you know, we'll have to call on the CFT. Well, we'll have to call it as it is. I don't think they're going to do it. I think it's gotten so tight in the physical basis and so critical and more people are becoming aware of it that these big shorts, days are numbered. Mm-hmm. Uh, I keep repeating myself. So the last time we spoke as well, Ted, we touched on the idea of this delayed delivery situation for 1,000-ounce bars for the industrial users. So where do they mostly source their silver when they're using it up? For example, let's say Apple computers or Tesla, big industrial users like that. They get it through the middleman. Middle, the biggest middleman of all would be J.P. Morgan. Okay. okay, they are fully ingrained into every aspect of the gold and, and silver market. And there are a number of, of big dealers like them that basically serve as middlemen 
between the mines and the refiners and the ultimate industrial users, okay? There's middlemen in every walk of life. The middlemen in the silver physical demand that goes to industrial consumers are these same banks, okay, uh, commercial operators that trade and speculate on the, on the COMEX. I've always thought, I mean, it's obvious that the minute that uh, an Apple computer or a Samsung or a big industrial user, an automobile manufacturer, gets delays in their silver shipments. What we have is problems in the supply chain nowadays. It's just exploded. We got supply chain problems in just about everything, okay? And silver is no different. It's part of a supply chain. So the minute that the users okay, start to see actual delays in their silver shipments, which, which they're not going to advertise, okay? It's not something that they're, they're going to come out and, uh, and say unless they have to. But the minute they see delivery delays, they're going to do what any human being does, okay, in such a situation. They're going to try and alleviate the situation and prevent it from affecting their business, Okay, and having to shut down their assembly lines, et cetera, for lack of a critical ingredient, silver in this case, and they're going to double order, triple order. They're going to they're going to start to build physical inventory to prevent having to shut down later on, which is just human nature, but it just exacerbates the problem. Now, this might be going on now. I mean, it's, there's, they're not going to make an announcement of it, and I think for years, I've thought for years that. The big dealers, okay, like a J.P. Morgan, that's supplying, serving as the middleman between the mines and the refiners and the ultimate users, okay, they know this equation better than I do. And they know what the users are going to do if they're not given their silver supplies on a timely, just-in-time basis, okay? So what they've done, it's kind of like triage in, in, in a hospital or medical situation, okay, the middlemen have made sure all along that those industrial users are well satisfied and no delays are coming to them because they know what's going to happen, okay, if they start giving delays to the users and they're going to, the users are going to panic and start to buy more than ever. So they do it intentionally to keep the industrial users at bay and at peace. Okay, but it creates a situation because silver has an investment demand as well. It's the only industrial commodity that has both an industrial demand and an investment demand. It's a balancing act. And these these middlemen, okay, J.P. Morgan accepted because they've already taken care of themselves. They're like juggling 10 pins or 10 balls in the in the air at once. And only one has to fall, and only one industrial user has to be delayed in inventory, and could, it could trip off the whole thing. And that's exactly the way I see it happening, only at that time when an industrial user goes to panic and build up inventory because he's been given a delay in his silver shipments, okay, it's going to trip off the other side the investment side, okay, because as prices start to go higher, investors, just the way they are, we all are the same way, is that when prices start to go higher, they want to buy it more than ever. So it's going to set off this spiral between a vicious circle between the industrial users and the investment buyers, and the, 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 the triggering event is going to be the delay to the to the uh, industrial users, but then when the price goes up, it's going to be a triggering event for everybody. And it's going to have to, at that point, we're going to be in the position we have to blow off on prices to the upside and burn out before we come down big. And that's going to take some time and it's going to take a lot of price on the upside. So, of course, again, because the last time we spoke was in basically February, Ted, we spoke about this thousand ounce bar possibility of having a shortness. So seeing, let's say, the movement of these thousand ounce bars since then into the ETFs, let's say some into private hands, has this been helping, you know, drain the COMEX or whatever system that you want to call it, drain this thousand ounce bar market? 
Well, I mean, I'm not so sure about that term drain. Look, in the COMEX, I think it's pretty clear that maybe 50 million ounces have come out of the COMEX and into the Sprott Silver ETF over this the last six months or so, which I guess was at the time when we had the conversation because of the logistics. I mean, COMEX, the warehouses are in around the New York area. Sprott keeps its silver in Ottawa or someplace in, near the border in Canada. And so within a day's drive, and it's logical to say that, you know, 50 million ounces, it looks like came out of the COMEX warehouses and into Sprott. If you want to call that draining, you can call that draining, I guess. The, the bigger picture is this. The bigger picture is since February, okay, Prices are basically about the same. In fact, they were about the same as we were going back to last August or something like that. We've been in a fairly narrow trading range on, on silver, you know, bounded between, I don't know, 24, 25 on the downside, 27, 28 on the upside for, for a long period of time, certainly since February. And the fact is, is that it's kept silver demand at bay, okay? It, it, nobody's selling. I mean, we have the same 1.6 billion ounces that was in the COMEX and in the World Silver ETFs back in February. We have the same amount today. We have the same price. It's been like uh, six months just taken off the calendar. Not that much has changed. Certainly no one that I can see has abandoned their silver positions, okay, physical silver positions. And I got to admit that I don't think there's been tremendous buying because we haven't had the investment impetus of, of higher prices. But what that's also saying is that when we get, okay, we're not going to stay flatlined in silver prices forever, okay, when we get a breakout to the upside, which we will in time, I think at that point, the whole process accelerates and you'll get new people coming in to buy silver just on the price basis. It's going up. It's good. That's what, you know, it's the way of the world. I mean, people buy collectively, investors buy collectively as the prices are going up. As prices stay the same or go down, they're less inclined to buy. But in this particular case, they haven't sold. We still have the same amount of silver there. There's no reason to sell it. It's the cheapest asset in the world. It has the most profit potential that I can think of anything. So, okay, it's not moving up in price. It hasn't moved up in price in six months, in a year, or something like that. Okay, so what? Well, it will someday. It's like, you know, we all live in a day and age. We want instant gratification. But at the same time, Sometimes things take time, and what's prevented the price from going up more than anything else is cheating, you know, on the COMEX, but that's unique to silver. But when prices go up, you know, the cheating tends to fall, could fall by the wayside this time and set us up for this tremendous move higher. The, the manipulation, I, look, I talk about it. It's a bad thing. It's uh, evil. It's uh, These guys are cheating and they're crooks and all this kind of stuff. But at the same time, it's the single best reason to buy silver because it can't stay manipulated forever. And anybody who believes that it can stay manipulated forever shouldn't buy it. Don't buy it. I mean, that's the best reason in the world not to buy it. But in the meantime, to anybody who's studied the history of manipulations throughout the world, okay, and what happens when a commodity, a world commodity gets dirt cheap as silver is right now, it's like the best opportunity. You, could, you couldn't make up something like this if it weren't all true. Absolutely, Ted. And, you know, that's definitely one thing I've gotten from our conversations. And that's something that people bring up. If if silver is so manipulated, why would I invest in it? And exactly as you bring up, it's a very reasoned. It's the best. Exactly. It's the best reason. All right, Ted, do you have anything else you'd like to bring up before we finish up here? No, nope. just get some silver and hang on to it. Excellent, Ted. Of course, you're available at butlerresearch.com and you post some of your articles up on SilverSeek. Anywhere else you'd like to point to? Some other sites pick it up, but I mean, there's more on the site itself. There's two articles per week. Excellent.
All right, Ted, thanks so much for your time and your perspective today. Really appreciate it. Thank you, Tom. This podcast is for general informational purposes only. Nothing on this podcast should be taken as investment advice. Guests on this show are not compensated for their appearance. Listeners are urged to educate themselves and make their own decisions. Do not base any investment decisions on the information contained. To view our full disclaimer, please visit our website.